Sure. Um, can everyone see my screen there? Mm. Audio is fine. Yep. Great. Um, so as thank you for having me this evening. And as Brendan said, my name's um, Toby Dean. I'm the Communities Manager at Nightingale Housing. Um, Nightingale Housing um, is a not-for-profit developer based in Melbourne in Australia. And we have projects kind of all around Australia and hopefully international at some stage. Um, in Australia, look, some of you may be from Australia, some of you may be from other cultures around the world. Um, we have one of the world's oldest living cultures, a culture that has existed here for over 60,000 years. And Nightingale Housing, we operate on Wurundjeri lands. They're the traditional owners of the lands on which Nightingale operates. Um, it's a beautiful country that they've looked after and been cared for by Wurundjeri people for a very long time. Um, this connection to country, to land, to the environment is something that we hope to continue in our philosophy. And the sharing of ideas, of stories and of knowledge is an important part of this connection to country. It's something that we look, I don't know about other cultures in around the world, but it's something that is kind of prevalent in Australian society to acknowledge the traditional lands on which you are on in an effort to um, strive for reconciliation and equality. So who are we? Um, Nightingale Housing is a not-for-profit organisation. We typically build apartments that are socially, financially and environmentally sustainable. One of our kind of main drivers is that we believe that homes should be built for people, not for profit. So we're an organisation of around 15 people, um, but we have quite a big impact um, in Australia. We've kind of led the way in regards to multi-residential development and changing the discourse around how communities can operate in inner city areas. Um, we strive to make our cities better places to live, and we hope to create connection between residents and encouraging sustainable habits. Um, this is a photo of, they're probably all Nightingale residents. We had a party. We had a big party when seven of our buildings opened up and invited everyone on the street, had a bunch of local performers and things like that. One thing we'll always say is we exist to revolutionise the way we live together. Now, it seems like a big statement, but we do believe it. Um, housing is such a fundamental right and the way in which people live together has in many ways, or in Australia anyway, contributed over the kind of last 50 years to an isolated population. So people are experiencing isolation from each other, from environment and from systems and from their neighbourhood. Um, and we hope to change this through simple means. It's something that happened in... Older cultures, it's something that definitely happens, but we just want to make sure that it does happen in our communities. Um, we're a registered not-for-profit. So that means that um, any we can't kind of make a profit. If we do, it has to be returned to our mission. So it has to be returned back to delivering housing for those who need it. Um, we've been a not-for-profit for about two years or since April, or about a year and prior to that we were called a social enterprise which is a similar thing you are allowed to make a profit as a social enterprise but in Australia a not-for-profit means that there's a lot of kind of uh, boundaries or limitations as to what you can do and rules that ensure that you operate ethically um it enshrines the ethos of the founders and the directors in perpetuity, and no one can kind of embezzle money or take money out of this organisation. It essentially has to stay within the organisation. We all get paid, of course. Yeah. Um, we get paid a good wage, um, but we are a registered not-for-profit. There's no incentive for us to, you know, do better economically, for example. We aim to house diverse communities and our communities are diverse. So since we began, our aim has always been to lead by example, reorienting the housing market to focus on good housing outcomes. Um, for In Australia, for those who historically have been locked out of home ownership, um, we'll go through it a bit in the detail, but 
we aim to allocate 20% of our housing to community housing providers and another 20% to key community contributors. Community housing in Australia is housing that is provided to those who need it most and usually capped at a percentage of someone's income or below market rate. Um, we also have apartments specifically designed for people living with disabilities. Um, our designs are simple. There's no thresholds or steps where possible and a variety of spaces. We want people to age in, in place. We encourage multi-generational families, um, single people, whoever it might be, to live within our communities. Um, this is one of our homes. Um, look, and all these photos, they're just taken by one of my colleagues who works with me. Um, she's amazing in communications, but she also is pretty handy on a camera. So we've completed over 400 homes. Um, it doesn't sound like much, particularly probably for those of you in Japan, um, but for us, this is huge. Um, they're spread across around 12 buildings, mostly in Melbourne, but also regional Victoria in Adelaide. Something that's really important to us is we've provided around 62 homes for community housing providers. So historically um, in Australia, people who have um, access to government or community housing are generally lumped together in sometimes an undesirable home or an undesirable suburb or put to the fringes or in areas that are disconnected from infrastructure, transport, health, education, whatever it might be. We want to bring those homes back into areas that are connected, areas where there's support, and there's no difference between our apartments. So the most expensive apartment in the building might look exactly the same as the person that's living in the community housing. To us, there's no difference. Um, there's no difference in the design and there's no difference between the people living in them. Um, and for us, it's look, inclusionary zoning exists in many parts of the world. Um, it doesn't exist as a policy in Victoria at the moment. We self-enforce this. So we self-enforce that 20% of our homes must be provided to community housing. We've got about 254 homes under construction. Um, this is one of our resident groups. We kind of catch up with them throughout construction. So we let them know how the building's going. We educate them on construction on the supply chain on if our businesses are using first nations owned businesses or even just trying to create a connection so people aren't moving in with a bunch of strangers um it's not much but our residents tell us that it makes a big difference in their feelings of kind of safety and security when moving into their apartment that they may already know a lot of those people before they're you know moved in together and we've got 78 more homes for CHPs or community housing providers under construction. We've got another 500 homes in planning across Victoria, New South Wales and South Australia. So we've, we've got a lot coming. Um, uh, for many communities around the world, um, housing is at a shortage. Um, Australia is currently classified as being in a housing crisis. At the moment, the kind of two main topics within the media um, seem to be housing and the environment. Um, so it's those two kind of linked together or separate issues, which are the most commonly talked about um, in the media. Um, Australia also has a very kind of high expectation of the great Australian dream, which is to own your own property. I guess why we started is because as I said, we're, we are in a housing crisis. And this is a crisis that for us presents itself on three fronts. This is an aerial image of a new suburb on the outskirts of Melbourne. Um, there's nothing wrong with these developments or the people that may live here in any way, but the, the kind of dark roofs, the lack of community, lack of infrastructure. There's so many things that put these people um, in social isolation and in social crisis. Um, we believe that densification in areas where there's correct infrastructure and better environmental principles can help people um, get out of this crisis. Um, I'm sure you're all aware 
It's a worldwide thing. It's an environmental crisis. And we'll talk about some of the environmental principles later as well. And a financial crisis um, in Australia, and look, I'm sure it's um, kind of similar around the world. We, we, we very much have this goal of home ownership in Australia, and it currently takes around 11 years for a medium income family. So that's two income owners just to save a 20% deposit in Australia. So that's the average at the moment. Look, 50 years ago, it was a quarter of that. Um, and now we're finding that, you know, that that's that's a really hard thing for people to get to. And then when people are taking out a mortgage and paying for their house, then they're, you know, with interest rates and everything like that as well, inflation, they can be, it can be very unaffordable. At the moment, 89% of kind of 18 to 39 year olds, which I'd say most people, um, I can't say everyone, but I'd say most of us in this room are in that category don't think they'll ever get into the property market currently in Australia. But one thing we want to do is we're in a housing crisis and not an ownership crisis. Um, there's a lot of homeowners in Australia. Um, we believe that um, there's just not suitable or adequate housing in Australia. There's a lot of people with a lot of money. There's a lot of people who are very well off but there's just not good supply for everyone. We wish there was more renters' rights, that there was better rental agreements, that there was better government housing, but the property market in Australia is geared towards home ownership. Sadly, at the moment, or oh, by 2036, we need around 730 social housing units. So they're the units that community housing provide you know we say we've built 68 or whatever it might be you know what nationwide we need around 730,000 by 2036 it's a scary number and in Australia at the moment the people on the waiting list for social housing is growing every year um, and not just in line with population it's growing um, quicker than that Um, so the growth of social housing units require, oh, over the last kind of 13 years has only been 28,000. So to reach, or 29,000. So to reach that, what we would need is an insurmountable task. Just in comparison, Australia currently has around 4.2% of our population live in subsidised housing. So government housing, community housing, um, getting rent assistance, whatever it might be. In London, that we have some of the lowest figures of this around the world. So in London, it's currently around 24%. In Vienna, almost 45% of people live in subsidised housing. Um, and in Amsterdam, it's around 47%. But we believe that kind of access to housing and investment in housing um, is an incredibly important facet of Australian society. Women's property initiatives, who are a group that we work with, they provide housing to women in need or women escaping domestic violence. Um, they believe that for every $1 invested in housing agencies, over $11 of social value is created. So that's not spending money on homelessness services. That's on the direct impact that that may have on people's mental health. That's in not, yeah, there's so many kind of trickle on effects from just giving people a home. And so because of this crisis, because of the kind of multitude of factors that come our way, we decided to do something about it, I guess. So we we envisioned, and look, I've been here for quite a few years now, and prior to that I was living in a Nightingale, so I've kind of been part of this community for a while. Um, it's for a new housing system. We We build homes. We don't build real estate as a commodity. You can't buy a Nightingale home if you're an investor and going to rent it out. Um, you can't buy a home and sell it the next day for a huge profit. We have caps on things like resale and everything like that. 
So for us, it's about fostering community to combat rising social isolation and designing buildings that positively tackle the issues of climate change rather than adding to the problem. As I said before, we don't make a profit. And if we do, it does get returned to mission. We sell our homes at cost. So whatever it costs us to build them, plus the fee of any consultants and things like that, that's how what people pay for them. One of our key kind of principles, and all of these photos um, are within Nightingale Homes. That's actually Dan, um, our CEO, who's my age, um, and work alongside him for quite a while. One of our key principles is building less to give more. And that's in a kind of sustainability of reductionism. It, it kind of sounds simple, but we remove whatever we can um, by it not being there is the kind of lowest footprint, you know, in regards to carbon, resources, whatever it might be. So you'll see that we've got exposed, in Australia, this is kind of, you know, weird, I guess. We've got exposed services, concrete soffit ceilings. We're using the form ply that was used to pour the concrete as the kitchen joinery after it's been cleaned. There's all sorts of things. There's recycled timber floorboards. There's concrete benches made from rubble that was collected on the building site. Um, so it sounds simple, but it kind of takes a bit of work to make that work aesthetically as well as um, socially. Probably said connected communities like a hundred times this evening, but we do build on as connected as we can. This is one of our buildings here and it's built on the train line um, as close as we can, really. Um, we want people to be connected to their urban environment and utilise existing infrastructure. We also, at the moment, our current kind of height limit is about eight storeys. Um, and the eighth storey is generally a rooftop and shared spaces. Um, we want people to feel that they are still connected to the street space, that they're not hovering above you know, society in a, in a different way. And we're not building in the inner city at the moment. We're building on kind of connected suburbs um, just outside the CBD. Um, so here, just this site here, there's a train line. There's this where this man here is. There's a bike and pedestrian path that goes all the way to the city. And then about 50 metres behind us as well, there's a tram connection and bus connections as well. So try and give people as many options. Something we're incredibly proud of is our buildings are fossil fuel free in operations. So we don't plumb gas into our buildings. All cooking, heating is electric. So induction cooktops, electric heat pumps, and generally water is used for or hot water or hydronic heating is used for our heating. Um, gas is a huge polluter. Um, in Australia, it's about to be renamed from natural gas to fossil gas, which I think is a really um, good step. Um, gas is a huge polluter and has many significant health impacts on the pe on the people that work in it. Um, there's new research about it being used when to light it on cooking and all those kind of things. So our buildings are powered by 100% green power. Everything's electric. We have solar panels on every roof, heat pumps operating like a battery, and for the additional power required, we buy 100% green power direct from wind, solar, and hydropower suppliers. It's one of our most important principles. And when talking to all our residents, it's actually one of the main reasons people buy is because of our fossil fuel free housing. People want to lessen their carbon footprint and their impact on the environment. Um, this is James and, sorry, I probably know. This is James and Bonnie's house. Um, James works at Nightingale. Bonnie works at an architecture firm that designed this building. I've got a beautiful little daughter called Hen. But this is an example of those robust quality materials again. We're not afraid that a lot of our buildings look the same. That's fine. Um, it might save us some money. It might mean that we can deliver them quicker. Um, thermally efficient. So our homes are highly insulated. In most cases, we don't have any air conditioning. Um, Brendan, although you may uh, resent that today, um, 
And we just have heating provided by hot water in the cooler months. And as I said, it's all electric. <coughs> um, but one of the most important features of our homes are their shared facilities. So this is one of the rooftop laundries. They have a functional purpose, but they also mean that people interact with one another. Um, we have shared laundries, dining areas, bike parking, all those kind of things that are shared facilities. It's kind of a small, to us it seems small, but to many people it's kind of the main point of contact they might have with other people and getting to know each other. Um, so quite a simple thing has had quite a big impact. We often have a bathhouse, um, which is a relatively strange thing in Australia, perhaps not in Japanese culture with the culture of onsen, but um, Aberdeens have a bathhouse on the rooftop. Not everyone has a bath in their house. They all have a shower, of course, um, but we have a bathhouse for shared facilities. Something like this is a move where it allowed us to have a smaller footprint home, so smaller bathrooms, cheaper homes, and a shared facility that people can be um, utilising. Something that's new to us um, is called a tile house. Um, it's a compact studio apartment. Um, even with doing everything we can to reduce the cost of housing and get new first home buyers into housing or get young people or um, people who historically have had trouble accessing housing, the prices can still be too expensive. So what we did is we did a tile house. Um, tile house, uh, it's a stolen from a German word for part of house. And it's a studio apartment. Um, it's just a tiny, in Australia, it's considered very small. Um, you know, the bed is often built right in next to the kitchen. Um, the bathroom is tucked behind the wall there. Um, it's probably not uncommon or it's probably large in many ways for apartments in Tokyo or kind of cities in Japan, but in Australia, it's a relatively compact home. We've found that the people who have accessed this have been incredibly happy. They've, they've, they've moved out of rentals where they've had to share houses or share rooms or whatever it might be. And yeah, we've had some really, really lovely feedback on this from the people who have moved into it. Um, that person before Krista, she's a um, nurse in an operating theatre. She's not home that much. And for her, it's perfect. We've just had Cam, another person, move in and he works in disability work. And he said he's been having so many people through his house and, and loves it. So we're, we're kind of proud of them. Um, Australia predominantly relies on cars for transport, you know, in general. Um, we shirk away from that. We don't provide car parking. So our buildings, sometimes there might be some go-get or shared car parking, but we don't provide private car parking. We want to kind of decouple the idea of home ownership and car ownership as being together. Um, it also means that you can have a cheaper home because you're potentially not paying for a car park you don't use. So we have sustainable transport. We have partnerships with this bike company who offer Nightingale residents a cheaper e-bike um, on a monthly fee or whatever it might be. And as I said before, we have all the local transport. We sell our homes at cost. 20% of our homes are sold to a community housing provider. 20% is sold through a priority ballot. So we are quite popular. Um, that sounds kind of strange to say, but we, we are. Um, and so when we go to sell our homes, we have thousands of people wanting to buy them um, to ensure kind of equity. Um, we do a ballot. Um, so the first 20% of people we draw out of the hat come from priority categories. So um, it's what single women aged over 55 um, who are living alone or with their children, because at the moment in Australia, they're the fastest growing group of people experiencing homelessness. Um, it's disabilities, people with disabilities or their carers, um, key community contributors, so people who might work in health or social work or fire people, um, police people, whatever it might be, 
and then First Nations or Torres Strait Islanders, so Indigenous Australians. And then the remaining are just sold by the general ballot. I'm just going to quickly flick through what we've done. So this is kind of our heartland. This is a train line running through here. That's that bike path. There's two stations. I'll go through it quickly. We built the Commons a few years ago. I used to live in there. We then built Nightingale One, um, which at the time won so many awards. It won the Melbourne Prize, which is like the Victorian award for the building that has the biggest impact within the state. Um, and that's where our office is. That's our office on the ground floor there. We did a little park along the street. We built Nightingale Anstey, which is just here, just south of here. We have a bit of a monopoly on this area. There's 54 homes in there designed by Breathe Architecture. We then um, got pretty bold and we did six buildings all grouped together and it's called Nightingale Village. Nightingale Village has also just won the um, Melbourne Prize and various other prizes around. So there's Nightingale Evergreen um, for the architects in the room that was designed by Claire Cousins one of Australia's leading architects. We have Nightingale Park Life, 37 homes. Um, it went, it's pretty yellow, it's quite cute. Um, it was designed by Austin Maynard Architects. Um, this building is quite special. It has these big kind of open areas between the apartments, so in the lobbies with this cage here. And people have pulled all sorts of things out here. So there's dining tables, there's ping pong tables, there's plants, there's a little veggie garden, whatever it might be. We then have Nightingale Left Field, um, 28 homes designed by Kennedy Nolan. This is their rooftop when they just move in. The garden is now looking a lot better. Nightingale Courtyard, this is designed by Hayball Architects, and this is some in interior shots of the homes. We have Nightingale Sky House, um, they've all got names, which is nice. It gives people a kind of sense of identity and ownership. Designed by Breathe, that's Poppy the dog. Um, Nightingale Urban Coop. Um, this was an intentional community. So this group of people came to us as a collective and said, can you please help us develop a home for us? Um, and then we have Nightingale Wudawudubik, which is an Indigenous word for sky country. These are all our projects under construction. William Gunga, Nagar Terrigal, which is another five buildings along the lane here. Built in Fremantle in WA. We've built in South Australia in Nightingale Bowden. Currently building in Preston, another suburb. We've got a big plans for Brompton. We've built a first project in regional Victoria, Nightingale Ballarat. We've built in Fairfield, Nightingale 2. You'll see that a lot of them look alike. Um, this is some of the community members there. Nightingale Brunswick East. Nightingale Yumaku Way. Nightingale Sydney, Moyne Marrickville. Um, and they're all our kind of current projects. Sorry to click through them quite quickly. Um, I thought some interesting things to talk about tonight, though. Um, it all sounds fantastic. Um, sounds great, but we have had some significant barriers and we'll continue to have some significant barriers. So um, one of the things that's really difficult in Australia or in kind of popular areas is access to land or access to land that's not ridiculously priced um, and able to be sold. So that's one of the barriers we play, we face. Um, even just the price of land in some of the suburbs we wish to build at the moment means that the cost of housing that we would then provide by the end, you know, you add everything on, for us it's too expensive um, because the land costs are too high. Um, we would love to be able to get things like concessional, concessional land from government um, if, you know, ideally they're not selling their land. We wish that government wouldn't sell their land and would develop it themselves. Um, but if there was concessional available to not-for-profit developers, we would welcome that. Another thing that's tricky in Australia is access to impact investment. Um, Australia's lived through a very kind of booming period for the last 50 years, and a lot of our investment 
um, wants really high returns. So we're talking, you know, 10 to 15% um, every year, which is terrifying. Um, a lot of investment in housing in Scandinavian countries and in other parts of the world, even in parts of America, they're banking on a much lower return. So the people that are investing in the property might be expecting, you know, five to 10% or potentially like there's some that are even two to three um, for super funds um, investing in housing in Scandinavia. So because money costs more in Australia or in many places, but for us it costs more, it does have an impact on our housing. We wish that there was more investors or people with money who would think of the impact that their money could have by providing it at a lower rate. Another thing that's um, affecting us is the cost of construction. So it's escalating hugely um, over the last few years. I think it's kind of COVID commenced that escalation and it seems to have continued. Um, we really hope that it can at least flatten out um, for the next few years. And there's challenges for the CHP. So for the community housing providers, even just getting money from the government getting grants, getting funding um, has been difficult in Australia under a relatively not progressive government for the last nine years. We've now got a um, more progressive government who have better environmental and housing policies. Um, so there is more allocation to housing, but it's, it's a tough one in Australia. So I guess, what do we wish for? We wish, we wish for connected communities this is, we wish for activated streets. I think I helped paint this one. Um, and what we want is to go from this, properties in connected, lively neighbourhoods to this. So this is Nightingale Village in the same spot. These are some of the businesses and people that call um, our buildings home. So there's an amazing little pantry and grocer on the ground floor. We have a bike store that is a um, social enterprise um, so it's another kind of not-for-profit bike store on the ground floor of our building. This is a cafe that teaches people who previously haven't had employment how to work in hospitality, um, and we've given them very cheap rent. There's a beautiful classical piano um, training room for people who may have experienced disadvantage, but also people who um, pay for it to use a piano. There's graphic design studios, there's architecture studios, there's landscape studios, there's psychologists, there's florists, there's hairdressers, there's people making beautiful food, there's people with their dogs, there's people with their children, um, all hanging out. And that's what we wish for in our kind of buildings. Um, for us, I think it's really important that we recognise the impact of housing um, and Nightingale at the moment are kind of leaders um, in that type of housing in Australia, but we do really wish there was more people doing a similar thing. Um, we openly share our knowledge. Um, we always, we give tours of our buildings to whoever want it. Um, we continue a strong connection with our neighbourhood. Um, so we really do hope that housing can, you know, through sharing knowledge and through building it, um, we can have an impact on the housing in, in Australia, at least. Um, I might wrap up there, but I'm um, open for uh, many questions. So thank you for that. Well, thank you very much, Toby. That was fantastic. Um, very insightful, but also uh, fantastic photos as well. Just capturing the the beauty of the developments and also the the experience of living there. So I really uh, enjoyed it immensely. Um, we can open up to for questions. I'd just like to begin um, by uh, reflect. So just before this session, I was looking at the Nightingale website. And mm -hmm. um, as you may remember, I think it was in 2015, 2016 that I made that short video about the project. And at that time, the Commons was the only one that was constructed and Nightingale was under construction ac across, Nightingale One was under construction across the road. And now I just realized that um, 
things have changed a lot. Um, mm -hmm. I think that uh, I, I realized that uh, just looking through the news media, I realized that around was about 2021, mid 2021, there was a big change in the model. Um, yeah, it seemed like the original model, which you talked about as a kind of social enterprise, or the the uh, the news media was talking about a green architects collective. They sort of realized that um, it wasn't working, or they couldn't scale up. Yeah, to the extent that they wanted to, so they needed to change their model. And yeah. um, and the new model is a not for profit, isn't it? Yeah, correct. So what we were, we originally, like when we first started, we were a not-for-profit, then we were a social enterprise, and then we did go to a licensing model. So Nightingale as an entity was still a social enterprise, but what we envisaged, envisaged that an architect would come to us and say, we'd love to do a Nightingale. We're, we're going to develop it ourselves. We're going to do it in this suburb. Um, can you help us? And of course, we'd help them. We'd teach them about our partnerships and plans and environmental principles. But what that meant is it meant that architects were actually taking on the role of a developer, of a project manager, of community engagement, of, of so many different things. And it wasn't working well for the architects. They developed some very amazing projects. Um, but for them, it was a burden financially. Some of them lost money. Uh, it was difficult. Um, and for us, we wanted it. Like, we're not afraid. That was not a mistake. Um, there were some very amazing projects built, but we wanted to make sure that it continued in a, in a good way. So from then we, we stopped. A lot of those projects are built under the licensing model, uh, but then we stopped and we kind of bought everything in-house. So we have in-house project managers, in-house community engagement team, in-house comms, um, you know, communications, we have a CEO, we have a board, those kind of things. And it helped us to like do better, bigger projects that have a broader impact. It also allowed us to partner with community housing providers and ensure that we always do that or we always do this. So it's been a good shift. Yeah, it, it, it seems to work. It worked because yeah. you said you've got 400 homes yeah compared to and where the previous five years was quite slow. Or so. yeah and look it's really good for the architects you know they're now doing what they do best which is design um they're not trying to manage every aspect of the project so okay yeah, yeah. anyone got a question comment oh i can see if a few hands go up so um mm -hmm. oh, well, let's start with Alexandra then, and then after that, Alex. I'm, I'm not sure Craig looked like he had a question too. Alexandra. Yes, uh, thank you so much for the presentation and your time. Uh, okay. I would like to ask, um, at the beginning of organization, did you face any challenges? And if yes, how you overcome it? Because now I can see that you're working really fine, and I'm so happy that I know that some people are doing this kind of job. So thank you. Thank you. Um, to be honest, we're still facing challenges. Um, it's still difficult. Um, I think some of the things that have caused us the most pain is probably planning laws. So um, planning restraints, planning requirements, um, all in all, planning is good, you know, government laws and those kind of things, but the process can be incredibly time consuming. Um, and we, you know, every day costs money and every day that it takes longer means that the houses get more expensive for us, you know. And so one of the main challenges we've faced is, is planning. Um, projects might be getting knocked back. People, like a lot of Councillors have had issue that we don't have car parking, that we have put solar panels on top of our roof, that we're using recycled water, that originally when we didn't want to put gas into our buildings, that was almost not allowed. And now it's actually the rule that that's happening because of the work that we've done. Um, so, yeah, planning has been 
um, a, a big challenge. Um, there's been other challenges like land cost. Our popularity has been a challenge as well. Um, we had a pretty small team when we first started um, and we were getting a lot of uh, inquiries and um, pressure. So I think they're the two kind of, they're some of the main challenges. Yeah. Luckily, staff isn't a challenge. Like most people have, barely anyone's left. A few people, you know, now and again. Yeah. I guess because they feel like they're doing something worthwhile. Yeah. 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 Motivating, isn't it? Uh, Alex, yeah. did you have a question? I had I had two if that's all right. Um thank you, first of all. Um, but one of the things that you did mention is that obviously the price of land is, is one of the, the major considerations for you guys. So I mean I'm assuming that you have to fight for that too, right? I'm assuming that there are other people who want to buy up that land. Um, and obviously your this not-for-profit business model obviously requires that to be as low as possible since you're not charging rent and things like that. So I was just wondering if you had any any insights on that front that can be applied into other countries or or how are you guys going about that? I'm just curious on that front. Yeah, yeah. Look, it's tricky um we we don't really have a huge strategy in this in that well we actually just have to change where we're looking um so we do have to look you know further out or look at places that potentially may other people may not see as desirable um we also are working with governments and local municipalities to try and get land that um, we're currently working with a church. Um, in Australia, churches are, have quite a lot of land holding and a church has allowed us to develop a portion of their land because it aligns with their mission. They're going to provide housing on it, for example. Um, for us, um, I'm not sure how those would translate to other parts of the world. Um, one thing that I personally wish would happen, and I know that it happens in some other countries, is that not-for-profits um, social enterprises, ethical developers, get access to things like a 99-year lease. So if government owned the land, um, giving it to a to a not-for-profit for a 99-year lease, um, so government or council retains ownership and we can develop it on their behalf to provide housing. Um, I think there needs to be some... Um, like I wish there was incentives or tax incentives, you know, if we didn't have to pay stamp duty uh, or land transfer tax or whatever that is in other countries as a not-for-profit, I think that would be really appreciated. Um, that does exist in some countries when you do pay less taxes on land transfer if you um, can prove ethics, yeah. Which country are you from? Um. Uh, U.S. and Canada, a little bit of both. Yeah. Yeah, 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 which is interesting because in Canada we have those things for not-for-profits, but not in the U.S. Yeah, yeah. Great. Does anyone else have a question or comment? I was wondering if you could expand on the pricing model. You said you consider, I believe, the person's income in terms of rent in order to keep people who are just seeking profit, like buying out the the, the housing units and then selling them for profit. Uh, how do you exactly do that? Yeah, so if you purchase a nightingale, so say I bought one for half a million dollars, you know, just for, for sake, um, we part of the contract of sale says that you cannot sell that house for um, anything more than the local area increasing over time. So if I bought in Bruns Brunswick, which is where a lot of them are, and the property market increases by 5% each year, you're allowed to sell your house at that kind of capped rate. It's part of the contract. Um, we don't want to deter kind of natural, um, like we don't want to disadvantage people who may have bought their first home. It's not that kind of deterrent. It's more of a deterrent for investors. So they can't buy it and flip it you know, because we're incredibly popular as well. Um, they can't buy it 
rent it out at a huge price and then flip it for, you know, 20% increase after one year, which they could likely do. Um, the other thing we do is we do have a rental cap. So if you own one of our properties and you do have to rent it out, it can only, I can't remember the exact percentage, it might be like 4.8%, um, but you can only rent it out for 4.8% of the property value per annum, um, something like that. Yeah. Um, so if people want to sell their home, they have to come and check with us before they sell it on what the maximum price could be. Yeah. Cool. How's the reaction from other builders? I think that there's been, oh, I think I came across um, other builders being very unhappy about the commons not having parking spaces and that they were the ones who were going to the council to complain about mm. the Nightingale model. Have you, has the, have those tensions remained or? Yeah, you... yeah, yeah, they'll, they'll always remain. Um, you know, we're, we're pretty loud, you know, we're in the media a lot. Um, we're pretty proud of what we do. Um, yes, so our building, this building like Nightingale One doesn't have any car parking and it's not only builders but it's also people who live in the area don't want their residents to impact on their amenity so they don't want their cars parked on the street or filling up the roads or whatever it might be the other thing for builders is that it's strangely meant that there are now people who might be buying a home um, which would usually come with a car park saying I don't want that I don't want that car park and I don't want to pay for that car park because I don't have a car and they've already built, you know, a 200 car park basin that's part of their uh, basement that's part of their construction budget. Um, so it's, it's a good thing for us, you know, uh, it's a shame if materials are wasted and things like that, but, you know, car parks by and large are likely going to become relatively defunct spaces if we shift to a, you know, ride share or electric more kind of shared car um, future as well. So if people are designing car parks, they should be flexible, um, I believe, and we believe. So Yeah, I totally agree. If you, mm -hmm. We don't have a, a car park for our place here. And um, we have good transportation links and we have a, a the railway line quite close. And then if we need a car, there's car share as well. Yeah. So it's the blood, it's a, a small shift in thinking resolves mm. a pretty major problem very easily. And I think, I actually think that's what the Nightingale project is all about. It's a shift in thinking and expectations um, yeah. around uh, homes that if everybody adopted it, it would have a huge impact. Gabby, you look like you're going to ask a question. <laughs> uh -huh. But uh um hey so you might be able to tell I'm I'm also Australian but I live in Sydney um I'm really curious about the Marrickville project is it, has it been completed yet no so Marrickville's under construction okay. um and Marrickville you know how before I was talking about the church um it's actually oh, yeah. on church yeah it's on church land and it's our first project that's going to be built to rent so people can't buy okay. yet that property um and it's all going to rent and it's all going we're, we're figuring it out uh but it's probably all going to be at 80 percent of market rate so if a rental in marrickville was 500 dollars a week this would be 400 dollars a week um which is a good thing um yeah so it's and it's also they're all studio apartments so it's a very different project for us. I think it's due for completion uh, towards the end of the year. So if you are in Sydney, we actually will be having like open for inspections and tours and stuff. So you're welcome to keep an eye on it, come along. Yeah, that'd be awesome. That sounds really yeah. suitable for yeah. in the city, Sydney. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. good. Cool. Fantastic. I, I wish we had something similar to the Nightingale approach in Japan. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Japanese. I mean, we we have some interesting things going on here, but the 
standard approach to housing and apartments is to build um, a fantastic showroom, mm. and everything in. So, and then um, essentially they make you're going from minimalism, whereas in the Japanese context they make the money out of all the design features. You know, you have a a television in your bathroom and and things like that, and uh, that that's. The profit and they waste loads and loads of money on these showrooms which then put up the price of the apartments and i think if they were um you know if the house builders and the apartment builders were avoiding that and going with nightingale the yeah. apartments would be much much cheaper here in this country mm. then the other side is that we have this huge uh, housing problem in that something like eight million properties are vacant around yeah. the country and actually, this was one of them. So um, we got a very, very reasonable price on this particular property. And then you just renovate it. And I think that's what yeah. a lot of uh, of Japanese people are doing. So it's a, it's a different dynamic. But mm. if you follow the regular um, market, then you're going to spend a lot of money. And yeah. you're going to maybe have multi-generational loans there. And I think you're starting to see a little bit of a shift. You're starting to see, for instance... Um, cooperative housing popping up and then this notion of shared living so that uh, young people are not necessarily um, fixated on owning their own places as, as quickly as possible they're changing it's a bit similar uh, with, mm. with regards to cars as well um, yeah. the, the Japanese young people are moving away from cars bit by bit so there's transformation happening there but it's um, I think the Nightingale model would work really, uh, it would be fantastic to have something like that here. And um, be good. yeah, finding, giving people access to affordable housing. Yeah. Okay, um, um, anyone got any additional comments or questions? No? Okay, well, um, thank you so much, Toby. That was excellent. I'm, I'm really inspired actually, because it's, it's a real practical example of how do you say doing something, taking action exactly. rather than just talking about it, which in you know in many instances people sort of say there's a housing crisis, there's an environmental crisis, but we can't do anything. We don't know where to start. But I think um, Nightingale just shows that it is possible to, mm. to really bring about a significant change. And I think what's fantastic about your project is that it's having an impact, it's spreading and people are following it. So I really do hope that, you know, it does spread overseas and mm -hmm. uh, to different countries, but it's, yeah, cause it's just fantastic what you've achieved so far. Oh, thank you very much. And thanks for having me this evening as well. It's the end of semester, is it for everyone? Yes, so this is the last class. So we'll just have a short um, end of class debrief and uh, I'll let them all free but thank you very much Toby that was thank fantastic. you Brandon. thank you so much nice to meet you all thank you yeah